love that I had to yawn the second you hit record. Oh my god. Uh, hello, welcome to today's episode of Juicing the Numbers, your statistics and sports podcast. I am one of your hosts, Joshua Tracy. And I'm the other, Corwin Heller. And we have a litany of things to discuss today. Lots going on in the baseball world as well as the sports world in general. Um, <clears throat> It is, uh, it is July 18th, and we are still fresh off the return from the All-Star break. Um, and yet, baseball has provided lots of uh, fun, interesting, and sad topics to get into, um, in addition to a couple other fun ones. So, Corwin Heller, you ready to get on down? You are goddamn right. All right, well, uh, so let's actually start off baseball and work our way over to it. And we'll start with, uh, I guess the thing that is probably the most severe that we have the least to say about, I would guess. And that's Richard Sherman, um, who was arrested earlier this week on uh, domestic violence um, or domestic assault, I should say uh, charges in addition to um, a bunch of other smaller charges and, you know, being drunk and making threats, stuff like that um, for drunkenly assailing his wife and then threatening to kill himself um, in what is really, I think, if you had to pick a person for this to have happened to, Richard Sherman, I think, is quite a surprise. He's obviously yeah. been a louder personality in the world of NFL, but always one of the more well-spoken and seemingly very kind Very of well put together. Yeah. Stanford grad and, like, a guy mm-hmm. who went to college for football but also took his education seriously. Um So this one was a surprise and it is um, awful to hear and it's awful for everyone involved. And it sounds like Richard Sherman himself is going through it right now. um, In addition to whatever his family must be feeling, but uh, obviously this is very new. So we have like no details, but um, I don't know, Corin, what do you, what do you think of this, this incident? I mean, you see the headline and you see the charge and it's hard not to, kind of jumped to that place where it's like holy shit i didn't think richard sherman was capable of this i can't believe he did something like that like immediately jumped to you know what the fuck happened how did this come about like why like what the fuck happened that brought this upon him because again he doesn't seem like the kind of person who would ever do something like that um but the fact that you know everyone in his corner you know his family you know close friends people who are very close on a personal level with Richard Sherman all kind of came out and were like, yeah, no, like this is very much not who Richard Sherman is. This is a, you know, singular episode where mental health kind of got in the way of, you know, public image or, or mental health got in the way of that's cognitive, you know, function got ahead of that, you know, normal way of thinking. Um, and kind of brought upon this meltdown. So I'm glad he has that support system around him who are going to help him get better and, you know, help him recover from this and everything involved with that. So, um, I mean, obviously we're both going to hope for, you know, a silver lining, happy ending with this. Um, and it just, it looks like it's in a good position to do so. It's just, you know, mental health breakdowns from anyone you know it's it's serious got to take it seriously yeah it's 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 a lot easier to look for silver linings and to be gentle with somebody like when it's a josh gordon situation and it's i keep doing this to me with in in regards to, to drugs and it's something that i need to overcome and yes it might be emotionally taxing on my family but the only person putting himself in any physical way is me and I think there's, at least there's a part of me, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of anybody else, that wants to see someone who does something fucked up and go, there must be recourse for this. But also mm-hmm. a lot of this stum- stems from other issues. And I would hope that this person can get the help that they need to stop being that person or to fix the issues that led to these actions. It's a lot I still believe that, but it's a lot tougher to have that opinion when, or have that feeling when it comes to a matter like this, where there is another party and a very intimate party directly affected. Um, So obviously, like Corwin said, hope for a silver lining in there somewhere. Um, As it stands, Richard Sherman's wife did appear with him 
at the court, it seems as though the main um, one of the stipulations of him being released from prison was no contact with his father-in-law. So this might end up being, um, I don't want to make any, any guesses, but it, it, there is a, I guess you could say potential positive outlook for the parties involved in this, but it, it is so hard to look at an, a situation that again, just directly affects someone so mm-hmm. close uh, to the person who's going through an episode and, try to balance your sympathies yeah i mean it's it's hard not to kind of jump to assumptions and something like this but you know so important not to but yeah hopefully we do have that uh that good ending a fairy well not fairy tale obviously but you know what i mean i know what you mean so let's do a hard old pivot onto our next topic no, no good transition here um and that is in a surprise twist of a turn of events, twist of events, turn of events, traipsing of events. Um, as the NHL expansion draft to accommodate the NHL's 32nd team, the Seattle Kraken, uh, is set to happen Wednesday, uh, July 20, 21st. Yep, I, that was not your audio cutting out. That was Josh stuttering to think if he was right. Um <laughs> The Montreal Canadiens have announced that they are not going to protect Carey Price, um, which is interesting. Um, supposedly, there is something uh, Carey Price has, has uh, some type of injury he had been nursing all season. So there's a as a health aspect to why they may not be protecting him. Uh, For anyone who's not been through an expansion draft, it works exactly as a fantasy um, dynasty draft would, where you protect a certain number of players and everybody else gets kind of put in a pool. Uh, And then the expansion team drafts and they pick X number of players from each team. And each team gets to protect, uh, I believe it's nine skaters, sorry, nine, nine forwards, two defensemen and sorry, no. Hold on. I, I, I thought I had it. Is it 13 skaters and, and, a, and a goalie? It's four. I think it's five, three, one or four or six. I know there's an option where it's four forwards, four defensemen and a goalie. Okay. Hold on. Or. All right. Okay. I got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cause, cause we're, we're, you're, you're the thing that I just did, which is just fucking guess. Um, seven forwards, three defensemen, one goaltender, or eight skaters and a goaltender. Why would you opt to get two fewer skaters, you might ask? Well, if you had eight super dope forwards and didn't really care about your defensemen very much, you'll spend that extra, or you'll, you'll lose out on those two extra protections to protect your eight super cool forwards. Um, which Most happens teams sometimes, won't. but yeah, it, it, it's not common. Most teams have at least one defenseman that they, you know, like, um, and if you don't, boy, you don't have many good players to take anyway. Yeah. So, uh, so what do you think about Carey Price? Not I, very likely not staying in Montreal for this it's, reason. It's a gamble. Like it is such a gamble by Montreal basically saying, Hey, he has, five more years left on his contract at $10.5 million per year as a cap hit. Boy, that is tough. Like that is a really, (laughs) really high number. One of the highest in the leagues. I mean, I'm pretty sure Jonathan Taves and Pat Kane were both uh, the two big ones making 10 for a while. Like Sidney Crosby doesn't even make uh, 10 a year. Um, wasn't uh, Connor McDavid's like twelve a year as the biggest in uh, in all of hockey? Regardless, so. um, it's a huge contract for a guy who's going to be thirty eight by the end of it. Um, but when you look at it, when you have a guy who can just kind of turn that switch in the playoffs, turn on that switch in the playoffs, and just become a complete lockdown, you know, number one in the world type goaltender with that presence in the locker room for, you know, a starting or, you know, a team that's starting out, it could be a, a huge uh, centerpiece for their team and for this expansion draft. 
and Montreal is basically saying, hey, we have Jake Allen. We don't think they're going to, you know, bother taking on this, you know, albatross of a contract just to take carry price when there's better, cheaper options available. Um, we'll see what happens. So it's it'll be a huge turning point regardless. Um, however, you know, whatever the decision ends up being on Wednesday, uh, this is definitely going to be the major, major point. Yeah, it's tough also to call this too much an albatross of a contract when it's your first season. And as we saw with the Golden Knights, having a good goaltender is, uh, I mean, a colossal mm-hmm. difference maker for to have something of a steady hand as you start off your franchise's career or existence. And yeah. if you have no other major players and you have no prospects because they have no prospects because the team just about to fucking exist soon, um, you don't have to worry about potential payroll adjustments you kind of can take that contract on with very little concern but you know it'll be interesting to see how they roll with it i would like to read to you uh the first paragraph uh which is all of one sentence i should say um of an article i was reading about this because it is fucking hilarious how they describe carry price you ready for this yeah among surprise names now available to the Kraken in Wednesday's NHL expansion draft is Montreal Canadiens netminder Carey Price, the one-time Tri-City American Juniors team standout, coming off a stellar playoff performance in which he made the championship round. What publication is this? Um, the Seattle Times. <laughs> uh, so it just has to be a, oh, he's, you know, from the area, you know, we're going to draw this in as much as we can by, you know, trying to claim it's a, uh, you know, hometown kid. Well, no, but, he's not. He's yeah. from British Columbia. I don't know. Then I don't I, know. I mean, it, it has to be tongue in cheek. It has to be because obviously Carey Price has many other achievements yeah. to his name. You know, like an all rookie, uh, a Vesna, um, Ted Lindsay Award, a Hart Trophy, like all-star appearances there's other things about carry price so this has to this must be a joke but it's very funny um yeah i would have to imagine he's going um now there are some other goaltender names actually i should say i should cut myself off uh matt murray in ottawa would be available um Mm -hmm. jonathan quick out of los angeles would also be available uh ben bishop actually yeah, I was going to say Chris, oh, Chris Drieger yeah. in, in Florida. Ben Bishop actually would be a, a pretty good get for them as well. Um, so there are other goaltenders that can be had rather readily. It depends on the general makeup that the team is looking for. Um, but a marquee name like Harry Price might also serve as additional reason for fans to come out to a stadium, especially to see a team. If you're a hockey fan in Seattle – and they draft a bunch of role players, but no marquee names. Mm-hmm. It might be, and you're a hockey fan, you know all the guys, but it might not be like, ah, we'll see. We've got Carey Price, and the Canadians are in town. Yeah, that 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 might be a little extra sauce to convince you to come on out there. Yeah. Uh, which very much so was the case also with Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, granted, that team ended up being phenomenal. Um, that the, the goal is the Golden Knights teams, but still, I mean, people knew who the fuck Mark Andre Fleury was. I love his. I know. I love Fleury so much. Oh, well, uh, is there anybody you're especially afraid of uh, losing from the Penguins? Let me pull up the Pens' uh, full list. There really wasn't anyone. Jason Zucker, I think, was the big name. Um, Really, there was no one that would be game breaking. Um, they protected Jeff Carter at like 35 years old, which, based off of how he performed in the playoffs, I don't mind whatsoever. Um, but I mean, the rest of the list was kind of what you would expect. Um, Marcus Peterson or Pedersen, excuse me, um, Casey DeSmith, Jason Zucker are really the big three that stand out. Oot. Yeah, it would suck to lose Jason Zucker. Um, that's probably the biggest name for me, probably the most likely name to get taken as well. Um, him or Marcus Pedersen really is, is really it. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, for the Rangers side of it, um, they, uh, they protected Georgiev. I don't believe they have to protect, um, 
Oh my god, what's his fucking name? Uh, sir. Du, 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 du. Igor. Igor Shosturkin. Thank you. Jesus yeah, Christ. Shosturkin. Fuck. Um, it's the fact that there was all of them with the same S last name. Yeah. Samsonov, Sorokin, uh, just everyone. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, I was at the kids' NHL debut and I still fucking forgot his name. Um, yeah. So the, I don't think they have to because uh, there's a rookie rule there. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of teams don't have to protect like their youngest guys because I think that would also just get insane. Um, so the Rangers are not protecting Barclay Goodrow. Well, I don't even know who the fuck that is. Um, Julian Gauthier, <laughs> Colin Blackwell, Philip De Giuseppe um, as Giuseppe? their forwards, oh. uh, defenseman Anthony Batetto, Brendan Smith, <laughs> and Tony D'Angelo, who essentially isn't even on the fucking team anymore. Um, and then their third string goalie, Keith Kincaid. Um, what, Keith Kincaid? Are you serious? I know. Can you believe it? Someone might actually want Kincaid. What? No, don't take him. Please, we have no. so much to suffer. Um, yeah, it'll I be... I hope they take Tony D'Angelo just... just at, you know what? I don't. I really don't. I, I don't either. Yeah, uh, I really don't. I want the Kraken to be a lovable team, not... I was going to yeah, say, I, I kind of want to root for the Kraken. I don't want to mm-hmm. hate them so immediately. Um, other fun names that are potentially available. Um, Kevin Shattenkirk from the Ducks. He's currently on the Ducks now. Yeah. Okay. I missed that. Uh, Jeff Skinner, season. winger from the Buffaloes. Nino Niederreier, the left Buffaloes. Wing. Oh, from the Sabres. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for catching it. No, Je- Jeff Skinner now plays fullback. Uh, well, yeah, he probably played like a slot receiver, but oh well. Um, Nino Niederreiter, left wing from the Hurricanes. Uh, Max Domi, center from the Blue Jackets. Uh, Vladislav Nemesnikov, still one of my favorite names. Uh, winger from the Red Wings, which is also a fun sentence. Uh, P.K. Johnny Subban Gord. of the Devils Ooh, would be a great yeah. um, veteran presence on that D. Um, Yanni Gord was the big one on the Lightning that I saw. Yes. Also, Tyler um, Johnson from the Lightning. Also, Andre mm-hmm. Palat from the Lightning. <laughs> yeah. And also, Matthew. the Lightning shouldn't be allowed to have players anymore. Yeah, it's stupid. Uh, who was the other big one that I saw? Um, Jordan Eberle from the Islanders. Come back to me. Josh Bailey from the Islanders. Yep. Matt Shane from the Predators. Ryan Johnson from the Predators. Sorry, Joe Hansen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of good players out there. It'll be interesting to see how the uh, new. Oh, um, Mark Giordano from the Flames. Mm. Big one. Yeah, there's a lot. He's of... up there, but he's a quality defenseman. Yeah, it, again, it'll be, we saw how low the bar was for the Golden Knights, who then ended up, you know, going to the Stanley Cup He's final 37. their first season. Oof. I looked up uh, Mark Giordano's age, and he's 37. That's tough. That's fucking old. <laughs> that's really tough. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's rough. Um, but yeah, anyway, the, the bar is, I think, probably going to be set higher for the Kraken than it is was for the Golden Knights. At the same time, I think when you see something as miraculous as that Golden Knights season, you go, well, it, it can't happen twice. So I don't think anyone's bracing themselves for another run like that. But at the same time, we saw what a all-star of lesser players, I guess we could say, from other teams managed to accomplish. An all-star roster of uh, lesser players from other teams was able to accomplish when assembled. So we'll mm-hmm. see what this suicide squad's able to do. Um, we'll find out. I'm very excited to, uh, to really follow along with this, especially since... Like with Vegas, we kind of expect a, a whole lot of trades to happen, a whole lot of money to be um, held on to by the Kraken to take on some larger contracts in exchange for, you know, draft picks and, and prospects. So I'm hoping for some big, big moving, big movement. I love Words. a big movement in the morning. All right. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh let's take it into baseball, man. Let's take it into baseball. We're gonna start off on another somber note, I guess. Um, which has a lot more silver linings, I will say, uh, than our other somber story of the day, which was last night, which is as of recording this is Sunday, so last night being Saturday, uh, in the game between the Padres and the Washington Nationals, uh, in the sixth inning of the game, uh shots, gunshots were heard um 
in the stadium. They ended up being from outside of the stadium, uh, just a couple blocks away from the ballpark itself. But at the time, it was very uncertain. And when you're that close to the sound of gunshots, with all the echoing from outside, it can be confusing as to where it's coming from. Um, and it caused fans to, rightfully so, panic um, and rush towards exits, be confused as to whether they should take shelter under their seats. Um, all Everything within the stadium ended up being fine. Again, the shooting had happened a few blocks away. Uh, latest report I saw was three people uh, injured and had to be hospitalized. I saw four. I had saw that it was four and then got corrected mm. to three. So I'm, okay. I'm well, uncertain, good. but the last thing I saw was three. So that's what I'm good. rolling with. Um, so it seems as though in addition to security doing their job, I suppose, um, some other really positive stories that came out of it were um, the concession workers doing a good job of shepherding people away from uh, like windows and, and uh, street mm-hmm. views to keep them protected from potential strays or being targeted if there was a shooter outside the stadium, anything like that. So huge shout out to the concession workers and the ballpark maintenance staff. Um, And also colossal shout out to a lot of Padres players, Fernando Tatis Jr. Manny Machado um, ushered fans from the stands into the dugout to bring them into the clubhouse for protection. Um, as did several Nationals players um, and brought them over to Davey Martinez's office who argued with security that they should be able to stay uh, in order to make them safe. So, uh, And a, a lot of those people specifically that were brought into the dugout were players' families. You know, they were players' families, you know, wives, kids, parents that were in attendance that, you know, thankfully they were able to, you know, just in case, obviously, if something were to happen, that um, the players and their families were kind of together. And David Martinez had a good quote that I didn't think to pull up ahead of time, but it was something to the effect of um, security asking David Martinez if these people were family. And he said, yes, these are family. These are our fans. They are family. Something to that effect, which was a, a very moving sentiment from but who is by all accounts, a very lovely man. So um, absolutely. Obviously, a scary moment when a real world, when one of the darker real world realities enters into uh, an arena it's not usually present in. You know, that's it's one of the things that makes when you hear about uh, mass casualty events at uh, concerts and nightclubs, one of those things that makes it especially jarring is that that's obviously not where you expect to hear the type of news obviously you know it's real but it doesn't feel like that's where it's it happens and yet it's a constant reminder that those things can happen anywhere but this story also brings with it the amount of good that the people around the people that could do something ended up ultimately doing and it's a a powerful sentiment for that reason though still a reminder of the harsher realities of life and you know always love to point out the fact that we heard that there was, you know, a mass shooting event or, or um, a, a shooting event of some kind at a baseball stadium at the Nationals Padres game. And were you surprised at all? I wasn't surprised. I mean, obviously, it was shocking to hear that it was happening, especially while watching the game. But at no point was I like, oh, holy shit, like this is completely out of left field. This is no pun intended. This is completely, you know, a surprise. It's like, oh. Okay, there's one happening. It's it's never expected, but in the same time, never a surprise. Yeah, it really it, it really was shocking, but not surprising. Uh, in part, DC it's already has a reputation as being a dicey area, and depending on what part you can be in, um, so there's that. But it's also DC has been under such. Um, tight watch security wise for how many politically motivated threats there have been in the last 18 months, especially that um, having that be one of the locations where you start hearing gunshots also sadly is not horribly surprising, Um, which again is a very sad thought, but also part of reality. But again, huge shout out to the Nationals ballpark staff. Huge shout out to David Martinez and the Nationals players. Huge shout outs to uh, Manny Machado, Fernando Tatis Jr. and the Padres players. Um, Literally couldn't ask for more from some people that a lot of 
people look up to already for their ability on the field and proving to step up in the highest capacity um, off the field. I say in quotes because it still happened on the field um, mm-hmm. when people needed them. So shout outs to all of them. Absolutely. Glad everyone's okay. So that being said, obviously there is uh, some other, yeah, let's get into it. Actually, it'll be a good segue. So I, two other things uh, before we ultimately move into a conversation about standings um, for baseball, since we are at a halfway point, um, ah, a little beyond it, but whatever. And that's the Yankees and Mets having uh, a slight touch of injury concern. We'll start with the Mets because it's a little bit easier. Uh, Lindor is on the IL and it is uncertain as to how long it's going to be. Now Lindor had been complained. He ended up coming out of a game against the pirates um, after I believe it was three at bats because he felt some tightness in his side. And that can be a very difficult thing to hear because tightness in the side makes you think oblique strains. And then it makes you think about how long that takes to recover from, you know, that sidelines a lot of pitchers for a very lengthy amount of time. And if it gets batters, it's, it's really no quicker. Um, right. Now Lindor is confident that he will play again this season, but it is uh, in a year in which the Mets were so primed to run away with their division and have not Lindor, who has not been a barn burner by any means has still been a steady hand defensively at short and has been a plus bat for them. So to have that missing from your lineup does make you go shit. So especially since it kind of, you know, bookends a season well, potentially bookends a season of disappointment all around, you know, when you are playing, when you still are on the field, when you're heating up compared to how you started the season, uh, comparatively, at least um, there's always that hope you could turn it around light on fire in the second half, you know, crazy things like that happen after the all-star break. And you expect that from a guy like, Fernando, not Fernando Tatis, Francisco Lindor. And now it's just kind of like, well, we're guaranteed to not see that this season. It's pretty much locked into being a disappointing letdown season after the Mets acquired him. Um, So it's a real shame for Mets fans. Yeah, Francisco Lindor's OPS plus by season, just to illustrate the point Corwin was making um, about how he has been improving. April, March, he had an OPS plus of 59. Not good. Yeah. Granted, 20 games, not a huge sample, but still. I mean, none of these are going to be big samples. It's by month. Um, May, OPS plus of 79. So still not great, but a lot better. Uh, June, OPS plus of 106. And July, OPS plus of 171. So really. That last one sounds like Fernando (laughs) Francisco Lindor. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and again, it's like Corbin said. When he, first off, also the guy just got traded. It's a new division. It's one of the toughest pitching divisions in baseball. It's a new ballpark. It's a new town. Giving the man a couple months to adjust, I think, is fair. Um, and it's it's tough to see him get shut down like this. So even though he only has a 96 OPS plus in the season, that 96 it was ready to cross 100. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, We'll get to the Yankees part of it, I guess, maybe when we get to the uh, AL East. So let's actually just start moving through standings now and work our way over to the AL sure. second, which we never do, um, just for the fuck of it. So, so uh, to make it easy on ourselves, since there's currently games still happening and Baseball Reference doesn't update their standings until after the, the day after, um, you know, so today, Sunday's games won't be marked in the log until – Monday, just understand we're talking about Saturday's standings, and if that bothers you, go fuck yourself. Um, so as it stands today, the Mets are only 47 and 42, which really ain't shit at all. Um, the Phillies are 45 and 45. That's two and a half games back. Atlanta's 45 and 46. That's only three games back. Washington's 42 and 48, five and a half games back. And then the Marlins are 40 and 51, which is only eight games back. For reference, the Yankees granted 47-44, so obviously they're having more success this season than the Marlins, and at least in the win-loss column, um, are also only eight games back. So this division, it ain't going to be over till it's over, and the Mets 
with how sterling of a season they've gotten from Jacob deGrom, how sterling of a season they've gotten from Taiwan Walker and uh, the rest of their rotation. Truly. I mean, Marcus Stroman has had a phenomenal season for them. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, Taylor, Tyler McGill, who's come up from uh, the minors has been pitching wonderfully for them. And, you know, they've gotten their pitching together really. And the batting has been bad. I was going to say has been inconsistent, but outside of Pete Alonzo and Jonathan VR, everyone else is below a 100 OPS plus uh, actually, sorry, addendum uh, Brandon Nimmo at uh, 145 um, Luis Guillorme at uh, 104 Guillorme. I don't really know how to pronounce that. Sorry. I don't know. I just, I know who he is. And anytime I hear that name, I picture him and all the fun shit he does. And he's just one of those lovable guys. Yeah. I picture inglorious bastards. Gorlami. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad we both got that fucking immediately. <laughs> um. So yeah, you know, obviously the Mets have been on top of this division basically all season, and you look at the really shit losses that like the Braves have had, and the Phillies, whose bullpen seems to fuck them in the ass on the daily. Um, and you know the, the Braves losing uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. for the season. Um, the Marlins never having truly put together Washington also being ridiculously inconsistent, a horrible season for Patrick Corbin. You might in, you know, without looking at the standings, be like, Oh shit, this is the Mets division. It is not. <laughs> it is not. Uh, what do you think about the NL East as it stands today? I'd love to have, Ronald Acuna healthy so that the Braves could, you know, three games back, fight for this division, win back after such a, a horrible start to the season compared to, you know, what their expectations were. The Phillies would uh, – any one of these teams could come out of nowhere and win it in the second half. It's really just a coin flip, and there's no team that you look at that you would even say has, you know, a significant advantage over any other team. So it's going to be a complete toss up between all five teams in the second half. I, I would actually disagree with that point. The Mets have been primed to take this division and have failed to do so consistently. They have Mets it up more than I've ever seen the Mets Mets anything. I... So I just want to. So, um, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. So what what are you arguing there? That uh, the Mets should, in theory, right. have been cakewalking through this season. Like, look, right. let, let's compare for just a moment the Mets to the Brewers, who for I would argue moment. continuously huh? the biggest lie that we tell ourselves on this podcast that for just a, a moment. <laughs> as we as we walk through the entirety of the Canterbury Tales. Um, yeah. <laughs> Because I, I would say that the Mets and the Brewers are positioned similarly in that uh, rotation heavy, right? Decent bullpen arms. Brewers obviously better at, at both fronts, but regardless. And the bats, you take what you can get and you hope for situational batting with the rest of it, which you can argue whether or not it exists, but you hope for it regardless of your belief system. Now, you look at the Brewers pitching, obviously they don't have the injuries that, that the Mets have. The Mets have had injuries to, you know, guys like Joey Lucchese, who hasn't been great anyway, but still he is hurt. Um, and David Peterson, who also hasn't been good, but is also hurt. Um, but you look at the guys that they've had, you know, they've got some phenomenal looking ERA pluses here, you know, 139, 361, and 155 from the three guys who have the most innings for them. And that stacks up pretty nice against what the, um, Brewers are working with their three inningest pitching guys at a 202, 173, and 104. Um, with Corbin Burns just below Adrian Hauser with a 175 ERA plus. So, I mean, really, we're, we're, we're right there with it. And you look at their reliever core. Oh man, I didn't realize it was that bad. Fuck. Um, who do you think has been their best reliever by ERA? Which I understand, not the best at. Suck my dick. Anyway. Uh, Trevor May. Trevor May is second best out of the main five 
by innings pitched. Um, not the first, though. Uh, I'm going to assume that it's not Edwin Diaz. Edwin Diaz is sitting at 94 after he got rocked last night. Yeah, yeah. I saw a chart of his uh, spin rate before and after the, uh, you know, the changes to uh, the foreign substance policy. And my goodness, he is a clear loser in that case. Um, yeah, I have no lost idea. the lottery there. Aaron Loop. Aaron Loop has a 159 ERA, a 247 ERA plus, and a FIP of 151. So he's actually out pitching his FIP, which is hilarious. And how Aaron many Loop in uh, 28.1 and in 28.1 innings, he already has almost a full war. Right. Wow. Yeah, wow. The stun silence is understood. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Hmm. That's wildly impressive. If his season ended today, today, it would be by war his third best season of his entire career. His entire 10-season-long career. That was, that was going to be my follow-up question, and uh, holy shit, that's a, it lot would be of, his, that's a lot of years. Yes, it would be his best season since 2014, when he was still with the Blue Jays, when he had a 1.1 war on the back of his best season, the 2013 season with the Blue Jays, at a 1.6 war. Aaron Loop finding new success with the Why Mets. Not? But anyway, um, back to the comparison. It really looks as though the difference here is batting. Obviously, there's some pretty low lows here with the Brewers. Keston Hira has a 55 OPS plus. Jackie Bradley Jr. has a 45 OPS plus. Um, Travis Shaw, who is now on the IL, but still before that had been in 56 games and had uh, 202 plate appearances, so a rather significant portion of their season, had a 67 OPS plus. But you look at who else they've had. Um, Willie Adamas, who I traded away before he got sent to the Brewers, and I'm kicking myself. Um, a 153 OPS plus, Colton Wong, 126, Omar Narvaez, 129, Christian Yelich, 111, Avisail Garcia, 110. And uh, almost any one of those guys would be the third best hitter on the Mets, if not yeah. eh, sec- second best hitter on the Mets, I should say. Yeah. That's the difference, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the end of the least. Uh, who do you chalk up as your division winner when it comes to the end of it at this point? Uh, I think it'll still be the Mets. It'll be I. It's it. I think it's going. This division is going to come down to to this month. It's going to come down to what happens at the trade deadline for these teams. The Phillies have been inconsistent, but a lot of that has been more personnel driven. I will say than necessarily underperformance from their main guys. You know, their bullpen has fucked them in the ass so much that they're going to need a colostomy bag. Like, they, if they can move some relievers and get a whole new refurbished bullpen, and I mean like three dudes, then they might actually have a chance of overtaking the Mets because their batting is there and their rotation guys haven't been awful. And similarly for the Braves, if they can figure out their fucking rotation just a little bit, uh, and I mean just a little bit, um, there's enough arms or enough bats there for them to still be good. Replacing Ronald Cooney Jr. for Jack Peterson obviously is not an upgrade, but it's still I think not the in worst that case, transition. I'm, I'm not putting much confidence at all in um, – and what the Braves are going to be able to do for the rest of the season, just mentally, I think starting the season off the way you did after, you know, before the season started, everyone was basically just giving them the division and saying, well, the Mets can make a run for the wild card. You know, the nationals can make a run for the wild card type of deal and losing Acuna. I think mentally they're just going to come back defeated. I wouldn't put much stock in the Braves at this point either. I actually think weird as feels to say the Phillies would have the best shot 
of overtaking the Mets, but it def- it depends on a lot of stuff going right. So let's take it over to the um, NL Central. We just talked about the Brewers quite a bit, so I'm going to leave them off. They're currently leading the division at 55 and 39. Following them, the Cincinnati Reds, 48 and 44, six games back. The Chicago Cubs, who are now sellers officially, uh, 46 and 46, eight games back. St. Louis Cardinals, 45 and 47, nine games back. And the Pittsburgh Pirates, 36 and 56, 18 games back. Now, I mentioned that the Cubs are officially sellers, and I mentioned Jock Peterson is officially on the Braves. Uh, two things we had not mentioned previously. Obviously, those two teams made a fucking trade. I'm sure we've all seen the news by now. I'm really not sure there's anything worth saying. So, anyway, like I said, we talked about the Brewers quite a bit. They seem a lock thus far to win this division. Only a six-game lead. I understand anything can happen. Still, their pitching is fucking nuts. Um, what do you think about the second-place uh, team here? Obviously, the there's not much separating the Cubs from the Reds. Uh, it would appear as though the biggest separator there is wanting to win, and not in the way we usually mean it, uh, in the way that the – GM of the Cubs owner doesn't want them to win because that's more expensive for them. Um, whereas it seems that the Reds might actually want to. So uh, how are you feeling about the Reds here hanging on for dear life to potentially make a playoff run? I just, the Brewers offense just did. I hate it so much. I just, they should be running away with this div- division with the way they're pitching. Um, but man, I think the Reds are in a really good position to kind of stay hot, you know, keep fighting and take this division. If the Brewers can't turn around that offense, I think the Reds take the division. No it's not. An, the Cubs. Yeah. Of the Cubs. My God. Um, the Cubs at this point are, are really just, a, they're a carcass for the other teams to vulture on, um, they might be third in the standings, but mentally they're last because they want to be. Um, yeah, the, the the Reds' rotation I think has been very good, and obviously Sonny Gray just came back today and didn't have a great start. But um, Tyler Malley, Wade Miley, uh, also the youngster Vladimir Gutierrez um, have all been really quite solid. Uh, Luis Castillo has bounced back quite well from what was a fucking bad start to the season i guess we'll say um actually i won't i'm curious now what his um era is by month um do i not have an era by month i only have opposing batting stats that's fucking stupid as shit why would i want that i demand you tell me baseball friends why i would want that that's so fucking dumb all I'm right, sure wait. There somewhere. I found it. Okay. It's there's months and then there's months game level, which show exactly the same months because no shit. Um, but one's batting stats and one's pitching stats. I don't know why. Um, April, March, uh, Luis Castillo's ERA was 6.29. Some might go, fuck. Uh, May, he went one and two, by the way. One win, two losses. May, he went 0 oh and six to an 8.04 ERA. One might go, ho, oh, fuck. Uh, June, he went 2-2, two and two, a 1.71 ERA. And uh, in, so far in July, he is 0-0 zero for zero with a 1.82 ERA. That is quite the tale of two cities right there. Really turning it around. Wow. Yeah. So, there is that. Um, yeah, obviously, there's... That's, that's so wildly impressive. Right? I mean, good for good for Castillo. But I think the, the real... This might end up being the most interesting division to watch in the NL because the NL East is such a fuck fest that whatever team finishes two games over 500 is seemingly going to have a pretty good chance at winning that division. Mm-hmm. The NL West is a powerhouse and three teams are going from that. We, we know that for a fact, whoever wins the division between the Brewers and the Reds will go to the playoffs and whoever doesn't is not 
And that has a, them perfectly positioned for this to be a fucking arms race. Because the- I, I was ready to really argue that point, but no, you're completely right. The Dodgers, the Padres, and the Giants, all three of them are going to the postseason. Mm-hmm. There's just no way these teams, unless one of them faces absolute catastrophe, is faltering enough to let the Reds and or Brewers through. And it's going to come down to which one of them puts the rest of their, you know, puts the whole picture together for the second half of the season. Yeah, I, I exactly. Like the Brewers have a one game lead if they were in the same division as the Padres. They would have a one game lead over the Padres, but having faced significantly worse competition because the rest of the NL Central. Um, so realistically, like there's no way the Reds are in second place in the division, six games back. And that's basically how far back they are from being a, a wild card team. Like there, there's there's no route for them that isn't winning the division. So it'll it'll be fascinating to see how these two teams approach the remainder of their season. Which uh, which uh, two headed monster do you think you would have more confidence in maintaining this throughout the rest of the season? Castellanos and Winker or um, Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff? Oh, see, so you I could th- even... I kept thinking Woodford at, at number one. I know. You, I mean, and you could you could even throw Peralta in there and call that shit a three-headed monster. Right. I was, try- I was trying to find a third batter on the Reds that I could kind of loop in there. But, you know, Jonathan India, Joey Votto, they're, they're not quite at the level of, you know, Freddie Peralta. Yeah. Yeah. I love that Votto still performing admirably at age 37, but a 103 OPS plus isn't, you know, knocking down any doors. Um, you, would, you would want it to be Eugenio Suarez, but his 61 OPS plus is not good. It's, Dude, it's real a- Eugenio Suarez finished 15th Eugenio. in MVP voting in 2019, having hit one shy of 50 home runs and since then has been. MIA 175 batting average 261 OBP and you might say is he slugging uh no 371 uh, he has not great he has the lowest on base percentage on the team of anyone yeah, you'd have to get down all the way to Scott Heineman, who has 34 at bats for the team, to find someone with a lower on base percent than a. Eugenio Suarez with a significant right. amount of plate appearances. That's ridiculous. I, I saw the 206 compared to Suarez's 261, and I read it as 260. And I was like, oh, that's more. Good job, Corwin. You suck at reading and math. Way to go. This is so tragic. Oh my god. Um, sorry, just looking at the Reds roster. Obviously, I would I would That's I would pick bad. I would pick the Brewers. Uh yeah. Yeah. Too. Yeah. All right. Uh let's move it on. Uh well, real quick, do you think the Cardinals magically get better next season, or do you think they fire Mike Schilt? Because why did you hire Mike Schilt? Correct. All right, uh, then, yeah, let's move on to the NL West, where obviously Corbin has a lot of opinions and feelings. The Giants currently lead that division at 58 and 33. And if you're saying to yourself, how is this still happening? We all are. We're all wondering that. It doesn't make sense. And as a neutral just fan. just off the Padres, by the way. Yeah. God, fuck the Padres, man. I Craig Stammen was in line for the win, and they fucked him. And then came back, tied the game in the ninth inning, and had bases loaded. Now, hey, could be worse. Could be the Mets. Could be the Mets. Um, so anyway, Giants, 58 and 33. The Dodgers, 58 and 35. One game back from the division. The Padres, 54 and 40, although it sounds as though that's now 54 and 41. Uh, five and a half games back. The Colorado Rockies are at 40 and 53, 19 games back. And the Arizona Diamondbacks, are 26 and 68. That is 33 and a half games back, but not mathematically eliminated from the division contention yet. No, 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 no. Don't you count out those 
Diamondbacks. Um, Corbin, again, you have the most intimate feelings about this uh, division. Why don't you tell me what you feel and think about it? At this point in the season, the feeling is that the Giants hold on to this lead and win the fucking division. It's just Dodgers are too all over the place. Padres are too all over the place. The Giants have been so fucking consistent this entire season. Their pitching's there. Their hitting's there. Uh, I know it could come all crashing down relatively quickly. I still guarantee they make the playoffs, but I think they take home the division. The Giants, that is? The Giants, yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can't help but look at the Padres and wonder, hey, what if you played in the NL Central instead? Um, you'd probably have 65 wins, wins already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, but how life is not so. Um, yeah, like just oh to God, read off, imagine. right? Just just to read off the OPS plus of the Padres starting lineup today. It is disgusting. Uh, Victor Caratini, catcher, has an 88 OPS plus, and that Back is the only catcher. number yeah. below 100. Backup catcher. <laughs> Who's your starter? He has the most played appearances. Uh, Aaron Nola. He was hurt. Not Aaron Nola. Austin Nola. He was hurt uh, for the first chunk of the season. Ah, I see. He has a 101 OPS plus and is currently on the 10-day IL. So we will oh, ignore yeah. him, but his is also very good. Um, Eric Hosmer, first baseman, 102. Jake Cronenworth, my guy, second base, 136. Fernando Tatis Jr., shortstop, 187. Manny Machado, 136, third base. Tommy Famine, left field, 130. Trent Grisham, center field, 136. And Will Myers in right field at 122. The bench obviously leaves a lot to be desired here. Um, between Jerks and Profar, Hassan Kim, Jorge Mateo, and Webster Rivas, um, 89. I, I see that based on his number of plate appearances. Um 89 is the highest OPS plus you're going to get out of that group. Um, so, you know, they say the difference, one of the main differences between uh, good teams and great teams is your bench players. It's your, it's your depth. And that's true of all sports. You know, you ha- if you're going to win in the NHL, you got to have a good third and fourth line. If you're going to win in the NFL, you've got to have good second, third stringers. And it's true in baseball. If you're going to win in baseball, your backup second baseman, who's going to give you a decent amount of, of, of innings that he plays a good amount of play. like jerks and profar, who is the fourth outfielder. So you go, ah, he's not playing that much. That's 282 plate appearances. That's a lot of plate appearances. Hassan mm-hmm. Kim, that's our backup infielder. That's 206 plate appearances. That's a lot of plate appearances this far into the season. Um, I think the biggest difference there is Mateo profar and Kim. All three of those guys are, plus plus defenders yeah and i think that's how you know the padres have been able to kind of quote unquote get away with this they have so many offensive stars and their you know offense is so unbelievably deep at all the starters their bench can be almost entirely defensive replacements and they're not really taking too much of a hit which obviously also has its place, you know, when come playoff time when you have a two run lead or less, you know, you're going to pull some starting fielders to put in your better defensive starting fielders, to try to hold down your leads. And, you know, that is to be expected, but um, so when do you think the Padres are going to, to trade for Kyle Hendricks? No, I don't know. Soon, but I don't want it. I want, want the Kyle? pitcher because uh, I want all the pitchers we already traded for to play well instead of having to just keep buying more and more until it works out. I, um, I got some bad news for you, buddy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know you were an Indians fan earlier. That's usually not how well it goes. Most teams have to churn, man. Yeah, no, I get that. I don't want to work for it, but you know, I, I totally get it. I don't know. Kyle Hendricks has just always been such a boring player. Because he's just Mr. Control, Mr. Pinpoint Accuracy, Mr. Consistent, you know. 
yeah, like that's great for a team. And like, yeah, he shouldn't be your ace, but boy, he can be a really great player for you because of that consistency. But I don't know. I want the Padres to be super fun, exciting all the time. You know, slam Diego. Well, the offense is there. It's the pitching that's the problem. You know, the Padres uh, rotation is quite lopsided as it stands today. You Darvish has a 120 ERA plus Joe Musgrove 127. Um, and then it's sadder. Uh, Chris Paddock, a 68 Blake Snell, a 71. Uh, the next most innings pitched guys are Ryan Weathers. Who's currently on the 10 day IL with a 128 He's ERA plus. Season. Oh, well that's unfortunate. Uh, Denilson Lamette, is he going to play more this year? Maybe. 102 ERA plus. Um, the guys who have been picking up the slack, uh, like the Padres bullpen and uh, the the depths therein, have played rather well. Um, there is not a single sub 100 ERA plus in the bullpen. Mark Melanson, 183. Craig Stammen, 132. Emilio Pagan, 120. Tim Hill, 148. Austin oh, Adams, Hill. 220 and then Nabil Krismat, uh 108 Pierce Johnson 123 I can sit here and read numbers all day um but they're gonna need another another guy um San Diego does still have quite a uh, a farm system they could trade for somebody with a little bit more control like Jose Berrios that could be fun or, or maybe call up number one prospect Mackenzie Gore please that'd be really oh, we got cool. confused and we signed uh Terrence Gore Ah, shit. Oh, wait. Is your name Frank? Ah, shit. How you look like you could play. You could make it work. Could you imagine Frank Gore just going up and just being like, I'm going to pitch three outs this inning and just make it happen. I don't doubt him. I've doubted Frank Gore for years, for like a decade. He's too old. He's going to falter at any point. Uh, why would I doubt that he could pitch as a reliever? Someone out there knows baseball really well mm -hmm. and doesn't realize that Frank Gore is not a baseball player. <laughs> and listen to the, you say that and go, who? 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 Am I dumb? Someone out there doesn't know football and just got very confused about who Frank Gore was and why I don't know that name. Because Corbin said he's been doubting him for a decade, and I feel like I'd know that guy. So if that was Everyone you, that guy, household shout outs to you. Yeah. Shout outs to you. Basically, basically that guy is um, Bartolo Colon, I guess. Yeah, why not? Who just like randomly pops up in your timeline every now and then, like throwing heaters to like 10 year olds and having a grand old time. It's hilarious. One of my favorite things about Bartolo Colon is like he retired from MLB. And just instead of facing, you know, Fernando Tatis and Mike Trout, he's facing like neighborhood school children. He's facing Fernando Tatis the third. <laughs> uh, Fuck. Yeah. Um, the, the Before we move on from the Padres, do you want to guess what uh, Jake Cronenworth's war is currently? Ooh, I bet it's pretty fucking good. But I don't want to overguess it because he doesn't play shortstop to get the, those sweet, sweet premium position war points. Last so year in 192 plate appearances, he finished with uh, 1.9 war. I was going to guess two and a half. Mm, this season? Yeah. Uh, that would be incorrect. Do you give up? Yeah. Four? 4.0. That's my guy. I fucking love him. Unironically, my favorite player on the Padres. Like, I love Fernando Tatis, but Jake Cronenworth is just like, ooh, he's my dude. Scrappy, white, yes. gym rat, lunch pail kind of player. Absolutely. Deceptively <laughs> athletic. <laughs> We're going to bring every very shitty football trope into baseball now. <laughs> oh. Damn right, baby. Anyway. Uh, yeah, the, the Giants are a big ball of, oh, that guy? Um, and that guy happens to be having a phenomenal season. Uh, what would you do if I told you that Brandon Crawford had a 148 OPS plus? You probably go, oh, Brandon Crawford's a decent player, but 140? I, did you read it right? I did. He's 34 years old, and he has a 148 OPS plus, 
which is the best season of his career by 34 points. And it seems like he shouldn't have that high of an OPS plus, but he does. And that's basically the entire story of their season. Um, like Mike Yastrzemski, you expected to be good, but did anyone yeah. expect Steven Duggar to have a 125 Ooh. OPS plus? Not even remotely. Steven Duggar didn't think he'd have that. How about Lamonte Wade Jr. and his 126 or Darren Ruff and his 152? These are names I'm amazed I've ever once heard before. I picked up Lamonte Wade Jr. by mistake in fantasy, and he's been wonderful for me. And then it was an accident. Um, and then their pitching has been rock solid. Johnny Cueto is their worst starter, and he has a 97 ERA plus, and that is perfectly fine. I need, to jump, I need to jump back in here for a second and bring us back to the Padres. Um, Hassan Kim, you're very familiar, correct? Yes. 74 OPS plus. Do you know what his war is this season? Well, he does play very, very good defense. So, but you know, famously, defensive war very difficult to come by. Very difficult to come by. Nowhere, even the best defensive players in the league are not going to approach the same kind of war. The best offensive players, not even in the same ballpark. And it's also tough to accumulate D war because the best way to do it is by playing premium positions. And there's really only three on the diamond that you can collect a lot of D war from. Um, very easily, which would be shortstop, center field, and catcher if you're good at it. I, you know, um, second base, first base, not so much. Corner outfield, not yeah. so much. Third base, a little bit easier, but still. Um, I'll I'll say two because I greatly underestimated Jake Cronenworth, so I'll try to recalibrate with Hassan Cam. You you overcalibrated. He has a one point two or sorry one point four off of a one point two DWAR in a hundred and eighty eight at bats. That's a phenomenal DUR, though. Holy fuck. That's unreal. He's had 188 at-bats, and he has 1.4 bar. Goddamn. Hassan Kim, I really hope you put it together, because I think you're very fun. Oh, yes. Um. Anyway, the story of the Giants is, like I just said, it's it's that guy. Yeah, that guy. Having a great year. Um. Is it sustainable? Who knows? If you're a Giants fan, do you expect this to last? Probably not, I would guess. Um, but you're on for the ride, man. <laughs> That's all that matters. Um, the Dodger story is a story of up and down. Um, for instance, how about the fact that Cody Bellinger, who I understand has been hurt and has only just recently come back, uh, but still 150 plate appearances, 61 OPS plus. Oh, that is half, literally half of Albert Pujols' OPS plus at 122. And that's kind of the story of the season. You know, Max Muncy, 173 OPS plus. Gavin Lux, 84. No. Mookie Betts. 158 OPS plus Corey Seager, who's now on the 60 day IL. Oh, actually 117. That's actually quite good. Um, So obviously their batting is still on the whole. (laughs) Very good. Sorry. I jumped into an awesome powers reference for a minute. And uh, the, yeah. Um, You know, that 84 from Gavin Lux is the only guy with a significant plate appearance uh, quantity that is under a hundred outside of, um, Austin Barnes, their backup catcher at 77, which you don't expect anything from that guy. Um, and then Cody Bellinger at 61, but you'd expect that to recover. Um, and then it's a lot of injuries to the rotation. Um, Clayton Kershaw is on the 10 day IL. Um, Trevor Bauer is obviously on administrative leave. Um, and then your other guys, Dustin May is on the 60 day IL. Um, uh, Tony Gonsolin's only just coming back. Victor Gonzalez is on the IL. Jimmy Nelson's on the IL. It, you know, like a lot of Corey Kniebel, who they took a chance on, so it's not a huge surprise he ended up back up on the IL, but still. Um, Bruce Dark. Mm-hmm. Actually, why isn't Bruce Dark Grotterol? It doesn't matter. Um, a lot of 
a lot of sporadic but impactful injuries, especially to the rotation. David Price is not supposed to be a starter for them this year. And David Price just started for them today, again, for his fifth start of the season. Um, and he's pitching well. Like, that's not a knock on David Price. It's just to show how desperate they are for pitching that a guy that they signed to not – or went into the season ex- not expecting to be a starter, even third in line to be a starter, mm-hmm. is now a starter. Which, I mean – we kind of saw this coming a mile away because of how deep they were to begin with and how consistently injured they always seem to be. So, you know, I know we talked about this when the season started saying, Hey, this is so valuable for them. You know, the depth that they have at at potential starters, because we know at some point it's going to come about where shit hits the fan and they need all the depth they can get. So glad they have it. If you're a Dodgers fan as a Penn or not a Penn State, as a Padres fan, not so much. Yeah, as a Padres fan, go fuck yourself. Exactly. Uh yeah. I mean, obviously they're like you said, they're positioned very well to stay being very it's not like they're struggling. Um, it's really just a matter of why aren't they winning? Like they've lost 35 games, and that's the surprise, you know. Like if if you had said at this point in the season, um, you know, before the season started that the Dodgers would have gone um, 70 and 23. I actually, as comical as a number that is, I don't think that would have surprised anybody. I, I really don't. Um, that's how good this Dodgers team is. So the fact that they're not up to an ungodly amount of wins at this point already um, is a sign of how hurt they are, but also how immensely talented they are top to bottom, T to B. Uh, Mm -hmm. so who do you see winning this division by the end of the season? Ooh, um, I don't know. I don't, what do you think? Yeah. I would have to say the Dodgers because at some point you expect all teams to face adversity with via injury because that's part of sports. That's again, not unique to baseball. The Padres have gone through it um, a a bit anyway in regards to their pitching staff and some of the batters. Um, The Dodgers are going through it right now. The Giants haven't really. They've obviously seen some. Kevin Gaussman had Mm -hmm. been hurt. Um, Aaron Sanchez is now on the 60-day IL. There's players who are hurt. But for the most part, there are guys – the guys you expected to be starting a lot have been playing exceptions. Also with the batting Evan Longoria, who's on the 60 day IL, he's missed a significant portion of the season. Um, And then Brandon Belt and Buster Posey currently on the 10 day IL, but still have played also a very significant portion of the season. And if it, if those injuries last a lot longer than they were expecting and the Longoria injury already has, um, but if the Posey and Belt ones end up, lasting longer than that um it wouldn't be surprising if they slip in the standings for that reason and if they get any thinner as a result of more injury and it's a battle of attrition and the dodgers are going to win that one every fucking day um, oh, i think the real interesting piece is going to be not can the padres catch up to the dodgers um but can the padres catch up to the giants because i really think the pod the dodgers are going to blow past them fair enough um I'll stick with my earlier prediction that the Giants hold on. Only one way to find out, buddy. Time. Yes, Time. Time. So Good we've song. been running for a while. Do you want to actually save the AL for the next episode? I was going to offer the same thing. Yeah, get because I like the deep dive, and I'd hate to rush through all three of those divisions. It seems unfair. Exactly. Totally um, agree. All right, cool. Then we're on the same page with it. And that'll be good because for the Yankees per side of it, we'll get a full perspective on how they handled this final game, this nightcap against the Red Sox to close out um, that series, which obviously has major divisional standing implications since the, um, I don't know if anyone's aware of this, but Boston is ahead of the Yankees in the standings because they are in the same division. I hope I'm not breaking news to anybody. Uh, Plus a few interleague games against the Phillies coming up, which will be interesting from a personnel perspective. Uh, perspective to see if Giancarlo Stan ends up playing the field. It has been said by Giancarlo and by Aaron Boone 
that they would like to see him in the field and have targeted the Phillies games. At least it has been rumored that there's been targeting of the Phillies games for that because national ballpark, national league ballpark, you don't get a DH. Um, So if that's the case, it obviously has greater roster implications for flexibility and using the DH spot more to talk about with the Yankees. When we talk about them again on Thursday, heading into, I believe, let me double check, but another series against the Red Sox. Uh, so yes, a four game set. So we had lots to talk about with uh, that division in particular. So we'll save that for Thursday. Um, Corbin, you got anything else before we get out of here? Um, no. All right. So just to recap it, uh, all the divisions are close. <laughs> oh yeah. Way to go, buddy. Only two players have won the open under 25 that guy and tiger woods the open and the player and the oh yeah the, open. the players championship yeah so, well something like that under the age of 25 him and tiger woods represent Company. represent asians man having a hell of a year love to see it love to see the asian pride in golf it's fucking great man Decolonize golf. <laughs> Decolonize. Yep, that's what we're going to go with. That's our new podcast tagline. Decolonize golf. <laughs> yeah, man. Japan's coming for you. Japan won the Masters this year. Japan has to have some pretty cool golf courses, right? I've never been there. I don't know. But like, probably. I'm imagining they're probably pretty fucking cool. I imagine the ones that they have there are some high-end ones that are probably gorgeous yeah. that are just truly immaculate yeah yeah all right well anyway let's get on out of here if you want to follow the show on twitter you can do so at juicing pod if you'd like to follow corwin on twitter you can do so at corwin heller if you'd like to follow me on twitter you can do so at joshua d tracy and uh, if you'd like to send us emails you can do so at juicing numbers at gmail.com um and until thursday for a discussion of the american league standings Y'all have a good one. Bye.